Oh, for some reason, it's just not the same if you can't sit in your seat. Oh. <clears throat> we are in Hebrews chapter 6, I believe. Well, let me restate that. Yes, we are in Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> so if you would open your Bibles there, we'll begin our study in just a moment. Let's bow and have a word of prayer before we begin. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you've blessed us with another day. We're thankful that we have the beauty of nature to remind us of your greatness. And we pray, Father, that we will dwell upon that every day and realize what you've done for us and give you the thanks for so many things, but especially the gift of your Son, that we might have salvation. We pray, Father, that you'll bless us this morning in our study. We might gain those things that would help us to be stronger and be more productive in your service. We pray, Father, that you'll help those that we're aware of that are not able to be with us or choose not to be with us. And we pray whatever their situation is that it might be made better so that they could uh, be back with us once again. We pray, Father, that you would continue to help us to understand that word, help us to have a deeper understanding and deeper commitment to make sure that we're willing to do the things that we need to do in our lives to be pleasing unto thee. We pray, Father, for this church. We pray that you'll bless us in our activities, help us to grow in, uh, spiritually and uh, numerically, and help us to be the, the shining light we can be in this community. We pray, Father, this morning that you forgive us of our sins. Uh, go with us through this day of worship and through the rest of the week. and. Forgive us of our sins and one day own us and crown us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 6. Now, what is the condemnation that takes place in chapter 5? What is it that the writer of Hebrews says, you've sort of uh, gone to sleep at the wheel or You've forgotten some things, or what? What does he say there that uh, that sort of triggers chapter chapter six? Okay. Uh, not only should they have developed to the point of where they could teach somebody about the gospel, but they had gotten to the point that they had forgotten the first principles. And the first principles are those things that teach us how to come out of the world of sin and to be obedient to the gospel and uh, to become part of the body of Christ. Those things they've forgotten about. Now, those things are quite simple. I imagine that if you go back here, I would hope this is the case, about our fifth or sixth graders, our teachers have done a good job, and you were to ask them what does it take for someone to become a Christian, I would hope that they would be able to tell you that. I think they probably could. So, so what's it saying when a group of adults who have heard the gospel, who have believed the gospel, who have been supposedly living according to the teachings of the gospel, get to a point that they can't tell you what it takes to be a newborn Christian? That's pretty sad, isn't it? Well, that's a condemnation that we find in chapter 5, and he says... We need to leave these things. We need to be able to go beyond the foundational doctrines of, of things that you have learned and go on and to do those things that uh, require you to, to exercise your senses, he says in um, the last verse of chapter 5. If you've exercised yourself, then you know how to do these things. And so he says, let's don't lay the works again, the the foundational works again. Let's leave those and let's go on to what we need to be, the kind of people we need to be. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And for God, it may not be a, a, a good term to use here. If you look back at verse 11 of chapter 5, what's the main reason that he says that it's hard for him to, to talk to them about these things? You don't want to hear it. And, and we talked about that. If you don't want to hear something, you're not going to hear it. You know, I, don't talk to me. I, you know, I've... I've gone down this path or I've made my mind up or I've gotten to a point where I'm just not going to listen. And it's very difficult to talk to people like that. When he talks about these foundational things that they should have a good grasp on and should be, be evident in their lives, they're not there. They don't understand things. It, it's as if they've forgotten them or what we see in chapter 5 verse 11 is it seems that they have decided to abandon them, to forget about them. And so he's talking about these things that uh, are foundational things that we need to move beyond. You know, that there is a resurrection, that, uh, that it does require faith. And, and by the way, what does, faith tend, what does faith, if it's the biblical faith, cause us to do? Move to action. And uh, so apparently they were, they were just sort of stuck, not doing those things that they, they knew that they should do. And so here we see, we talked about a little bit last week, the doctrines of baptism. We mentioned the baptisms that were uh, taught in New Testament times. We talked about John's baptism. Um, we talked about laying on the hands. Now, what was the purpose? We talked about this. What was the purpose of laying on of hands? And what does that mean, laying on of hands? What were they doing? They were imparting what? Spiritual gifts. And um, so the idea here is, what, why is this something we need to move on from? Why don't we talk about that today? Why is it uh, something that's not the very foundational things that we make sure our kids know about? Purpose has been served. We're not going to see it, are we? Now, that's a confusion for a lot of people today. It's like, well, I know I, we have these abilities. We can, we can do this and we can do that. And, and you know, um, I'm not going to question their sincerity, but when put to the test, they can't do those things. Because these were things that were uh, provided by the Holy Spirit, uh, direction of God, and uh, they had the ability to do certain things. But what was the reason that they had this ability? 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is a very good commentary on that. Uh, he starts off by talking about speaking in tongues. He says, you know, if I, can, if I could, could do all these things, if I could move mountains, you know, and all these things that I could do, and I have not love, then it doesn't amount to anything, does it? Because he goes on to say that we're, we're like children. And uh, he said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I acted like a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And he says those spiritual gifts that were given at that time were basically childish things. Why? Because they weren't going to last. They were there for a particular reason. They were there to confirm the words that were being spoken. Someone strolls up to you in your town and says, I'm from... Uh, from God and and I'm here to talk to you about the gospel what is that you know how do I know you're from God how do I know what you're telling me is any different than some what's these uh, priest uh, chief priest and 
uh, rulers of the synagogue. How do I know that you're any different from what they're teaching me? Well, God was with them, and he confirmed his um, direction. He confirmed what he wanted to have done through the signs and wonders that were performed. And the scriptures are clear in teaching us that. But some people have difficulties with it. They were there to confirm the word, this, that they're from God, that this is God's message, this is what God wants you to do. And you can understand a lot of that from the standpoint of the, the Jewish faith being taught for, for years and years and years and multiple generations how they should serve the law. And then all of a sudden, someone comes in and says, well, you need to do something different. Well, you know, how do you convince them of that? Well, there was the, the ability to do things. That was one thing that was a, apparent. But it was for those people who also had not uh, been part of that Jewish system, the Gentiles. Right. That, and, and as we look at, at the scriptures a little bit, we get a little better understanding. You have to understand where they were. It, we're talking here in, uh, in the times of the writings of the New Testament. Did they have a Bible? We know the answer is no. They might have had a, 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 some letters that were passed around. You know, as we talked uh, and, and studied the book of the Colossians last um, few weeks ago, how Paul encouraged them to not only do you read this letter, but pass them on to the Laodiceans. And so the idea is that there, there's probably was some of that going on, um, that, that the letters got passed around, but they didn't have Scripture. They didn't have the, the New Testament. And James tells us that uh, what we should look into uh, to make ourselves a, a, approved of God is the perfect law of what? The perfect law of liberty. What is the law of liberty? It's the will of God. It's what he has told us to do. Well, you know, that tells us what came about that was perfect, the law of liberty. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part will be done away with. And so these gifts had a temporary a place and they were to be moved on from. They weren't supposed to be held on to. Now, we see some problems in, in the Corinthian letter where they wanted to, to be able to use these gifts, not for the furtherance of the gospel, but for what? Money, their own personal gain. So many other things, they used them to benefit themselves. And we see the selfish nature sometimes of people. But these things were temporary, and they were to be, uh, to go away. And we've talked about this in this class before. The apostles had the ability to lay on hands and to impart the gifts to someone else. Those people that they imparted the gifts to, could they impart the gifts to someone else? And so what happens when the apostles die? That, that ability to pass on those gifts went away. Now, Paul had those gifts because he had received special revelation from Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he was an apostle, he says, chosen out of due season, but yet an apostle. And God, uh, Jesus gave him the ability to do the things the other apostles did. But when the laying on the hands were given to someone else, they had those abilities, but those people could not impart the gifts to someone else. And so they were there just for a period of time. And so he says, we don't need to go ahead and re rehearse these things and talk about them again. Laying on of hands uh, and a resurrection of the dead. Uh, we have doctrine that had been around for some time. The, Sa the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees did. And you know, Nicodemus in John chapter 3 comes to Jesus and says, and he talks about it being born again, uh, that kind of thing. We see that the understanding there that... Uh, and the fact that there is eternal life, there'll be some, some life after, after death. The Pharisees believed in that. We saw the resurrection of Lazarus and some others. And we know Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And so we see there's a doctrine here that deals with the resurrection of the dead, that there is life after this physical life. And so that was something that they needed to move on from. And uh, of eternal judgment. The fact that um, they were going to be judged according to what they did. 
that need, they need to move on from that. They knew that wasn't something that needed to be rediscussed or retaught, but it's something that apparently um, was an elementary thing that was discussed in New Testament times. And, and he says, these things we need to move on from. And then verse 3 says, and this we will do if God permit. This is what we want to do. We want to move forward. Whatever we're going to do is going to be at the will of God. Now, you, you look at some things happening in the world and you say, how can God put up with that? God is not trying to keep up with everything that happens in the world today. He's not going to categorize it and say, well, that's a bad activity. I'm going to do, do away with that. We're going to live in the world and the activities of the world will be carried out. But there are certain things that, you know, whether God allows it to happen or not. Um, two people want to get married. Now, if things work out, they'll be married, right? If things don't work out, they won't be. Well, that's what we're talking about here. Hopefully, God's going to permit. He's going to allow you to move on from these foundational things that you should have already known. And we're going to go on to some things that are, that are stronger for you on into perfection, the completion of your of uh, your salvation okay and, and completion of salvation is an important thing in this whole writing now here's the point you're 12 you're 14 you hear the gospel preached you decide that you need to obey it that that's commendable hope that happens in everybody's lives okay now time goes on 15 20 30 years later Hopefully, you're still living in accordance with what you have been taught according to the will of God. That's a pretty good long time. Maybe you're 60 by now. Maybe you're 65. Now, all of a sudden, at 65, you just throw your hands up. I've had enough. I'm just not going to fool with this anymore. It's so difficult. I'm having trouble with my health. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with my faith. I'm just going to give it up. Where's the salvation? Is it going to come? Where does your salvation come? Where do you receive the benefits of salvation? Not that you don't receive some benefits from living according to God's will as, as you live upon the earth, but where, where does the salvation culminate? At death, when we have completed our journey according to the will of God. So when we start talking about salvation, it's an important topic. We need to talk about it, no doubt about it. But the importance of it is when we complete our journey, okay? And so the point I'm making is I, I could live a, a Christian life for 40 to 50 years and then abandon it. And it, it hasn't done, it's done me some good because God's going to bless us as we live according to his will here upon the earth, but... The ultimate goal is not going to be achieved, is it? So that's what we have to worry about. And when we talk about salvation, this is what we're talking about. And he says, you need to move on beyond these things so you can get to the point of where you can see the, the benefits of it and you can see the, the, the goal being achieved of, of salvation. Okay? So he says, we're going to do this if God permits. For it is impossible to, for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good work of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew themselves again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Now, is this a sin? Is this the impardonable sin? We like to find that, we hear that, and we say, oh, is this the impardonable sin? Is this a sin that cannot be repented of? It says it's impossible. It's impossible. Makes you scratch your head a little bit, doesn't it? The point that the writer of Hebrews is making is that if you get to this point, if you get to the point where you have heard these things, if you have seen the things that have been done, 
if you've seen the power of God, if you have, if you have experienced the, uh, the hope of the gospel, and you've gotten to a point where you have thrown that aside, and that's what your decision is, what kind of state are you in? Okay? The point that's made here is that no one's going to come along. God's not going to say, well, you know, um, these people were, they were trying to, to live their Christian lives in difficult circumstances and, you know, um, time's going to pass and whatever their, their pressures are, whatever their persecutions are, uh, eventually maybe will go away. And then at that point, I'm going to come in and I'm going to bring another plan that's going to provide them salvation. That's well, not going to happen, is it? So if you have the understanding of New Testament teachings and you know what it takes for you to obey the will of God through the gospel and you say, I, I, I really don't want any part of that. I, you know, I'm just, it's just too difficult. I'm going to abandon that. If we get to that point, then we have to look back and talk about some things, okay? We have to talk about some things. What was the purpose of Jesus dying on the cross? How do you view that? If you're going to throw it all away, then what, what was the meaning there? You tell God it doesn't matter to you anymore these things that, that's been done for you to obtain salvation that Christ dying on the cross for him per, being persecuted and suffering and dying on the cross is of none effect to you it has not touched you in any way then how are you going to be able to brought, be brought to repentance you, you've abandoned it you've gotten to the point where you have you have looked upon the, the, the blood of Jesus Christ as something that was meaningless to you. And if it's meaningless to you, then you're not going to change. And there's nothing else that's going to come along that says, okay, well, since you didn't buy into that or you didn't stay steadfast in that, I've got another plan for you that's going to provide salvation. There's none other salvation that's going to be provided. So if you can get to the point where you can consider the blood of Jesus Christ, his death upon the cross, as something that was just worthless, didn't mean a thing, then there's no way that anybody's going to be able to reach you to change your life. Now, you need to understand that the writer to the Hebrew Christians is seeing them heading down a path that if they don't stop what they're doing, they're going to get to a point where they will, it will be impossible for them to turn around. Now, you talk to people today who knew what the truth was, who started down a path of things that they shouldn't have done, and they will tell you, I have done so many things now in my life. I cannot turn around. I have, I have caused so much harm, so much hurt. That's what they'll say. I, I, can't, I can't fix it. And so they continue to do what they're doing, which is live ungodly lives. They don't see any way that they can turn around. And so the writer is saying, look, you need to leave those things that were the very first principles. You need to move on to perfection. You need to move on to completion of your salvation. And he says, you will be able to do that if you don't turn your backs on what you're supposed to do. But if you do, there's a point to where you will not be able to turn around. And so he says here, it would be impossible for those who were once enlightened, if you knew what the truth was, and you're going to abandon it, how in the world would you ever come back to the point of where you knew what the truth was again or embraced it? There are people today who will tell you, I know what the Bible says, but 
I, I just can't abide by it. I'm not, I can't live according to it because they've been down that path and they have abandoned it. So it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew themselves again into repentance. It gets to a point where it's impossible. Not because that uh, it couldn't be physically, let's say, done. Not that God would not forgive them if they repented, but they're not going to repent. That's the point. The writer is saying you're going to get to a point down the road if you don't turn around to where you will never repent. Because if, you can, if you've been touched with these things, the gospel, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, the blessings of God, and you've turned your back on them, there's nothing that can reach you. And what a sad state that we can find ourselves in as humanity that we would abandon those things that God's tried to do to, to provide salvation. Now look at what he says here. He says in verse 6 that if they would do these things, what would they do to Christ? They crucify him again. Could you imagine someone who's obeyed the gospel get to a point to where they would crucify the Son of God again if they had the opportunity? It's just hard to believe, isn't it? But the scriptures say that you can get to that point to where you would in, in principle at least, you would crucify the Son of God again. Because you've just cast it aside. You can't, it's of no value. And then put him to an open shame. Now look how he explains it in verse 7. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh off upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is, whom it is dressed, um, receiveth blessings from God. I mean, the, the rain that comes, the ground's prepared, what's going to happen? It's just the old farming, the old farming uh, 101. I prepare the soil, I plant the seed, the rains come, the warmth is there, what's going to happen? It's going to get the increase. God's going to bless that. Okay? And that's what happens when a child, uh, a person receives the gospel. They have a, the tender heart. They're willing to uh, change their lives in repentance. And they're willing to live in accordance with that, the, the uh, principles of the gospel. They'll be blessed by God. Now look at what he says about those that will turn their back on that. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. If you reject God, your soul is not receptive to the teachings. You are full of thorns and, and thistles and briars, and you cannot grow anything there. That's in line with uh, everything we know about the teachings of the parables of the sower, and just principles in general. You go out here and you, you go to uh, some briar thicket and you cast some seeds in there. You expect any results? Ain't gonna happen, is it? And so he says, this is the kind of hearts you're going to develop if you don't turn around. And this is the principle he's given, that uh, it depends on the kind of soil you have, the kind of heart you have. And so he says, God's not going to bless that thorny, crusty, dry ground. You're not going to get anything good out of it. It will not bring forth any fruit. It's only good to be burned. Verse 9, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. This is what can happen. This is the road that you're on. But we're persuaded better things of you. We think that you can do something to turn it around. You need to change the way you're living. Don't abandon what God has given you through Christ. This is the message that's being given to them. 
But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. Remember what we talked about? Salvation is an important topic. We need to talk about salvation. Salvation should ever be on our minds. But salvation is only good, what? When we finish. It's only good when we finish. Okay? And this is the problem with the Hebrew Christians. They're giving up. They're not finishing. And so he says, you know, you need to finish. We think that you can do better things. And we're persuaded that you can do that. But these things that are co company salvation uh, that we're speaking to you about need you to remain faithful and, and uh, work in the kingdom. Verse 10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor love. If you are doing those things that are right, if you are providing love toward other people, those of the brotherhood and those that are even without the brotherhood, what's God doing? He's paying attention to him. And he says here, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor love. He's not going to forget those. He's not going to do the wrong thing and forget those things. He's going to do the right thing and remember them. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Apparently they were good and faithful to one another and kind to one another. And God's going to pay attention to that. But they've got to move on from that. They've got to grow and be able to withstand the difficulties that they, they find themselves in. And he says, We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. So you see the point that he's making here? You're doing good in loving one another. But what's the next verse say? But, but what else? But you need to show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Don't give up. You're treating one another with love. That's great. God's aware of that. But don't give up on your salvation. Hold on to the full assurance of hope until the end. And in doing this, he says, you, you've got to be people that are not Slothful, not sluggish. But followers or imitators of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. And this is exactly why we find chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews. Because what's the encouragement that's trying to be brought forth there? What's the message of Hebrews chapter 11? these people it's a message of faith but it's a message of people real people people that they know that they've been taught about that they have grown up understanding how they lived their lives and what's the message about these people they remain faithful and so he's saying look we want you to be like these others who we we're talk about who through faith and patience inherited the, the promises. It's a simple principle. But we have to understand it. This is not like getting out here and running a 5K race and you're okay if you cross the finish line you get some kind of little certificate. This is about eternal life. And if you finish the race, what are you going to get? You receive the crown. Salvation will be something that you have laid hold on. Don't give up. And I know in our world today, it's difficult because of the things that pull and tug at us and the directions that 
we get pushed into. But that's why it's so important for us to get together in situations like this and to instruct and encourage one another. Don't give up. Whatever you do, no matter how hard it is or how difficult, don't give up. Now, that's the message that he's trying to make here. Don't be slothful. Don't be sluggish about it. Be, at, be busy doing what you need to do. And look at those who have followed before you or who have gone before you that uh, you should have the kind of faith and patience that they did where they inherited their promises. And as I said, we're going to get in chapter 11. He's going to talk about all these. And he goes back to the, to the very beginning, for them at least. Verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, what did he do? These are some things we're needing to understand here as we get into the next few verses. There are two things that happened. There are two things that happened with Abraham. And of course, Abraham is the father of the faithful. And he is someone that we look at, they looked at. And there were two things that happened with Abraham. Okay, two things. First of, God, first of all, God made a promise to Abraham. Okay, he made a promise. Now, let's think about that for a minute. I make you a promise. Um, you've got something that uh, you're going to do Monday afternoon after you get off work and you need some help and... I said, okay, I'll be over there to help you. I have all the intentions of coming over there and helping you. I either forget or something comes up and I say, oh, he'll understand. And so he's over there trying to do a two-man job with one man. I used the terminology the other, uh, the other day talking about it and... Uh, the person said, well, I never heard that before. I thought it was a pretty common thing. You ever heard of a one-armed paper hanger? How do you hang paper with one arm? Johnny has a little bit of help there. Are you guys working on stuff? I know you've been there. I've been there so many times. I need one more hand. I need somebody to help me. Because not only do you have to hold something in place, you usually have to turn something. Or, and you can't do it by yourself. But when we make promises sometimes, guess what? We don't fulfill them. God made a promise to Abraham. What can you say about that promise? Knowing the, the personalities or the, the, the parties involved in that what can you say about that promise? God made a promise and God keeps his promises. That's significant. I have received a promise from God. Take it to the bank. It's going to happen. Right? I said there were two things. We're going to see this a little bit later in chapter 6. Not only did God make a promise to Abraham, which he could take to the bank because of who God is. And if God said for us to do something, he says it's going to happen, we ought to believe that with every ounce of our being because God makes things happen. He will fulfill his promises. The promise. Number two, the oath. 
You see the significance of this? God made a promise. Not you or me. God made a promise. It will happen. But God didn't leave it at that. He also made an oath. Now, we use that in times past, and, and, and we still use it today. We put somebody on the stand to testify in some trial. What do we want them to do? We want them to tell the truth, but what do we usually do to sort of confirm or sort of pretty much establish that we're hoping that they're going to tell the truth? They swear on the Bible. And so what we're hoping is, well, you may be sort of dishonest or maybe not tell the truth, but if you put your hand on the Bible and you, and you say you're going to tell the truth, we expect better things of you, don't we? We do that in society. God made a promise. It's going to happen. It was going to happen. There was no way around that it was going to happen, but not only did he make a promise, but he made an oath. He said, you want to know for sure that I'm going to do something? I'm going to promise you something which should have been good enough. But I'm going to make an oath on top of that promise. Look what he said. For when God made promise, there it is, to Abraham, what did his indication here that he did? Because he could swear by no greater... And that's the way men would do. When they made an oath in Old Testament times, what would they base that old oath on? They would base that oath on the, the, the most strongest thing that would drive them to do something right. You ever seen in uh, movies or, or maybe you've heard it personally, I'm going to do this or swear on my mother's grave. Right? Count that to be pretty special. You know, that means that I'm, I'm telling you I'm going to fulfill this. Right? And we see that sometimes. I'm going to do it on my mother's grave or, or whatever we can do that has supposedly great meaning to us. God, when he was going to make this oath that was going to ride on top of his promise to make sure that Abraham understood that, Abraham, I, I'm, I'm not just telling you this. First of all, Abraham would have had to have known because how he'd been blessed so far. The promise is made quite a number of, uh, of days or whatever years after he came out of Ur of the Chaldees, right? He's not like God hasn't shown him all these places and given him all this land, and Abraham's not a wealthy man. So he knows God's going to hold on to his promises, but God says, I, I'm going to make it even stronger than that. He says, I'm going to swear an oath to you on top of that promise. And it says, when he looked around and he said, I can't swear by anything stronger. I'm going to swear upon myself. The God of heaven is confirming the promise through an oath which he swore upon himself. Now, folks, I don't know how in the world to explain that. If the God of heaven has always done everything that he said he was going to do, unless it's going to occur in the future and we haven't seen it yet, if his promise is that secure, if his promise is that strong foundationally, that we don't need to ever question it, But yet God, to make sure that Abraham understood that there's no getting over this, that what I'm telling you and the promise that I'm making to you will happen. He confirmed it with an oath where he swore by himself. Now, that's the first bell. Um, we'll probably pick up here next week. Look at 
Genesis chapter 22, about verse 16 or 17. And also, I think it's Psalms 105. And look at these promises that were made. And we'll talk about those a little bit more next week. Here's the bottom line. What we're fixing to see is that God, who made this promise with Abraham, and you cannot make anything stronger than what God has made. This God has given you something with more assurance, more assurance than the promise that he made with an oath to Abraham. And if you're a child of God today and you read these words, then they must touch you and you must hold on to the faith. It's that important that this much time was spent writing to the Hebrew Christians. And yet it's a lesson that is important for us today. All right, next week, uh, I believe um, that we'll still be ha We're having some speakers come in next few weeks or so, but I don't think it's next week. So we'll pick up back on about verse 13 of chapter 6 next week.